It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, everybody, welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Borchine. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley right here at Colorado Springs. And I'm so excited that you are tuning in. We are continuing in our study of the book of Revelation. We are almost there. We are in Revelation chapter 22. After a year and a half, we are finally coming to a close of our study here. And we're going to try to cover the, the rest of the verses, but you know how it goes. So 25 minutes, it goes by quick. But let's uh, let's read verses 3 to 4. If you have your scripture handy, you can turn with me. If you're driving, we'll turn there later and study at your own leisure. But here we are, verses 3 to 4. We read... And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, this is following up on what we've been studying already about the new heavens and the new earth, and the new city, a new Jerusalem, a massive city that comes down from heaven on this new earth. And we talked about last week uh, of how this there's a water that flows from the temple, and, and, and there's a tree of life that we have now have access to, the tree of life, to eat of its fruit through all seasons, and here we're told now what John now sees in verses 3 to 4, that there will be no more curse, and the, the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and all the servants serve him, and they see the face of God, and his name is on their forehead. So the curse in view is probably the curse that God pronounced on the old creation at the fall. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 19, Zechariah 14, 11, Malachi 4, 6. So, so God will have an intimate fellowship with his people because this curse has now been lifted. He hasn't walked the soil of the land since the Garden of Eden. In fact, when God the Father came down even on Mount Sinai, it burned the top of the mountain. So here it is. He needs a perfect state in which to dwell. Nothing imperfect can be around him. So now he has fellowship with his people because all this, the evil is purged. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But the curse has now been lifted. So in, in chapter 22, verse 4, we also learn that God's bond servants will see his face. Now, Adam and Eve's sin broke their fellowship with God and they hid from him in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, for currently no human can look upon the Father and live because of our imperfect state. In fact, in Exodus chapter 33, verses 20 to 22, we read, but he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So our ability to view God's glory is limited. It's limited now in Job chapter 19, 25 to 27, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Hebrews 9, amongst many others. But then in this glorious state, it will be unhindered. According to 1 John 3, 2, we read here in verse 5, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So the final point that John stresses was the great glory of God that will illuminate the whole earth that we talked about in Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 to 25, and Zechariah chapter 14. So his bond servants will reign with him forever, not just in the millennial kingdom. It continues on into this new heaven and new earth. So the significance of the parallels, if you look at Genesis chapter 1 to 3, and Revelation 20 to 22, the parallels are just hard to miss here. There's immutability. And so while we're prone to change, God does not change. We read that from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. There's restoration. The world as we now know it is not what God desires. It's simply a stepping stone to a much greater work. There's progress. The new heavens and the new earth are actually an improvement over the state of the Garden of Eden. And there's no sea, there's no night, no sun or moon, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, verses 23 to 27 there. So much covered on that. There's great triumph. So eventually the big three, sin, suffering, and death, 
they'll be forever dealt with, no longer in this kingdom. And the beginning and the end, we see that here. Revelation 21, 6 says, God says, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus said, do not be afraid in Revelation 1, 17. I am the first and the last. So we can relax in our great God's sovereignty. And number six, there's unity of God's plan. In Genesis 3, 15, it points out that the plan that God has to defeat Satan through the offspring of the woman, that Revelation points to the consummation of that plan, that it is finished, it is a finished work of the Lamb, according to Revelation 5, 6 to 14. And it all pulls together the unity of the Scripture. Two biblical books written 1,500 years apart by different human authors, only God himself could have orchestrated this unity of the Scriptures. With all of the prophetic books, all of it point to completion, and every one complement the other, though there's 1,500 years apart, all between them written individually throughout that. So John concludes this book by giving us the bottom line. And Revelation could have ended with verse 5, that the curse is over and the believers will reign forever, and this is a perfect conclusion to Revelation. However, Jesus determines that he must reiterate a few critical exhortations. Let's read here in verse 6, Revelation chapter 22. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Now, number one there is we trust Christ's words. These words are faithful and true. Where we get hung up is it says these things which must shortly take place. Now, again, we were looking at a time in which it was written around 90 to 100 AD. Well, it's 2019. That doesn't feel like it's shortly to take place, but this statement reinforces a futuristic interpretation of Revelation. And it's ironic that people have neglected and avoided this book, even though it contains more promises and blessings than any other book of the Bible. And where we get hung up with this idea that it must shortly come to pass is actually a bit of a misinterpretation. What it means here is that when it occurs, when it comes, it will pass in quickly, in quickness. So it will take place rapidly once it occurs. So as we discussed, 120 verses of the 404 verses of Revelation are dedicated to the final year of the tribulation period. That means almost a third of the entire book is dedicated to a very short period of time. So indeed, it will occur quickly when it occurs. And we do not know the day or the hour. Scripture tells us that specifically. So many grow confused when they read that word shortly as though it was written to suggest that the days of the end were close to the time when John had written that book. And that's why these amillennialists determined to change the narrative from a literal reign of Christ to a period of church evangelism because they're trying to justify that in their minds. And this word for this quickness is used in Luke 18, 8, and it's a reference to judgment being quick. Or in Acts 12, 7, where they're told to rise up quickly as the chains fell off. So when the chains fell off, it occurred quickly. So when the days of the end come, it will occur quickly. So Revelation 1, 1, the same word is used to describe an imminent forthcoming event. It's not an if, but when. And when it occurs, it will take place over a short period of time when you look at the comparison of 6,000 years of human history. And Daniel 9 even refers to it as a week. That's how short it is in context when you examine it by the comparison of eternal life. So for better context, we can read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, for he says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So you see in that context, a little while still remains, but when he comes, he will not delay in accomplishing his promises. We also see the Lord speak to the prophet Habakkuk in the same manner. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but that at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So there's an appointed time, and when that time comes, it will be swift. In verse 7 we read, Behold, 
I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So we need to expect Christ's return. Behold, I'm coming quickly. This is the first of three times that Jesus declares, I'm coming quickly quickly he tells us says, behold and that's a term to grab our attention his coming could happen at any moment and and, and there's a, it gives us believers i believe a, a solemn assurance of the fulfillments of his promises after all 355 prophecies occurred exactly as they were foretold of christ himself at his first coming and, and so therefore we can trust that his second coming will be of the same so quickly means at once or suddenly he, he's coming suddenly without warning as a thief who comes without announcement as we see in second peter chapter 3 verse 10 so other than a trumpet call in the moment according to first thessalonians 4:16 jesus is saying i am coming so there must be a sense of urgency he said blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book the book closes as it opened with a special blessing for those who pay attention to what it teaches go back to revelation chapter 1 verse 3 and 16 5 now we read here in verses 8 to 9 of revelation 22 he says now i john saw and heard these things and when i heard and saw i fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things then he said to me see that you do not do that for I am your fellow servant, and of all your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 to 9. So John confessed that when he had heard and seen these things, he reacted by worshiping the messenger, i.e. the angel. And so this angel rebukes John for worshiping him as he did before back in Revelation 19.10 when John was overwhelmed when he sees the fall of Babylon. So he, in, in essence, he's saying, keep on worshiping, but you must only worship God. Don't worship the messenger. In verse 10, he says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, this is the opposite command that was given to the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verse 26 and 12, 4. The reason John was not to seal up the prophecy of this book was that the time is near. Believers must live in the light of Jesus' is coming. We read in verse 11, He who is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Now, this verse teaches that whatever a person's nature, that person's nature will be locked into it for all eternity. Now, that's a strong warning not to put off becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. When Christ comes, people will not be able to change their mind at judgment. When they're, when that, what they are now, that, that's what it will remain uh, during that time. So if after Christ's coming during his thousand-year reign and people have not given their lives to Jesus Christ, when judgment comes, as they are in that state, judgment has come, it is too late. Now, many Floridians have called... Uh, what they call hurricane parties. And, and what they do is they stay inside in the safest place possible when hurricanes are coming and they wait for the hurricane to pass. And as the hurricane blows through, it wreaks this deadly havoc, but then things grow deathly quiet. Uh, you, you can even begin to hear birds chirp. It's natural to think that the hurricane passed, but in reality, you're in the eye of the storm. And in native Floridians, they know that, but they, and so they, they'll stay put because they know the hurricane is merely changing course and will be coming back the other way. But a tourist from Colorado Springs on his way to Florida, his or her journey there, they may be foolish enough to go outside. So right now, I believe that we're in the eye of the hurricane. You can take his name in vain. You can shake your fist at God. You can tear the Bible apart. You can even persecute Christians. God's judgment is not necessarily instantaneous, but one day the winds will be reversed and judgment will come. Now is the time to get right with God for the day of the Lord is coming quickly. In verse 12, we read, and behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, instead of promising a blessing, as he did earlier in Revelation chapter 22, verse 7 and 16, 5, this time he promises to judge. 
So Christians should be diligent to lay up treasures in heaven while we have the time to do so, according to Matthew six nineteen to 21. Here in verse 13 of Revelation 22, we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus Christ offered three titles for himself that give assurance that we can and will fulf- that he can and will fulfill his former promise to reward. It means that he finishes what he starts. Jesus is eternal. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And that title stretches, stresses his eternality, his, his eternal nature, his sovereignty. The first and the last is also a title for Christ that we saw in Revelation chapter 1 and 2. And the Father is given this in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 48. And it emphasizes that God is the cause and goal of history, the beginning and the end, i.e. he is eternal. Verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to eat right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So some texts actually translate do his commandments to blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, the final blessing in Revelation then announces God's favor on those who cleanse themselves by confessing their sins. Remember, our works of the flesh are likened as filthy rags before the Lord, Isaiah 64, 6. So the robe is worn under the armor given to us by God through Christ Jesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. And the robe must be cleaned or it will stink And likewise, if we don't serve the Lord obediently, we're likened unto lukewarm water that he spits out of his mouth. The mouth of God spits us out, according to Revelation 3, 16. So John 14, 15 is an exhortation of Jesus Christ where we read, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So again, Christ is reminding us that our works are not for salvation, but as a result of salvation, demonstrating our love for him because he first loved us in 1 John 4, 19. So those who wash their robes in repentance and are obedient service to Christ will have access to even eat of the tree of life. Now, this is the first of the promises he gave to the overcomers. He tells them that they have the right to eat of the tree of life in paradise with God in Revelation 2, verse 7. Now we read in verse 15 here of Revelation 22, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So the blessing of access to the tree of life is contrasted with the curse of Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. So dogs is a metaphor for the morally impure. And here's and it gives us this it doesn't give us all the types of immorality, but there are other lists of wicked the wickedness of the unbelievers from Ephesians chapter five verse eleven and revelation twenty one eight so the unbelievers are outside the gates is it, 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 the image is depicted here, so some have speculated that as a re- result of this verse there'll be unbelievers on the new earth or somewhere in the universe outside of this city, suggesting that the cycle continues of light versus darkness after this culmination of a 7,000-year plan of God here on earth. And this line of thinking has led to the formation of many pagan religions who believe that they even have their own planets and become Christ-like figures of their own populations of newly formed people. So all of that's incorrect. As we've already read of the final judgment of the great white throne, the great white throne, the destruction of death and Hades in the lake of fire, and the eternal destruction of Satan and his followers, all in Revelation chapter 20. So the plan of God for the redemption of his people, his children, and the bride of Christ is complete. So this verse is giving us more understanding that the spirit of those who inhabit the kingdom of heaven as its citizens, are workers of light and not not darkness. You won't find anything of darkness there at all. He tells us that in Ephesians 5, 8 to 13, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things are exposed and made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. In verse 16, Jesus says, I, Jesus, 
have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The combination I, Jesus, occurs nowhere else in the New Testament, and it's used here to stress his role in producing this book, and so to strengthen its authority. It's not by John. John is not the author. It is Jesus Christ. It is his authority. So Jesus was the ancestor of King David, his descendant, his root, as well as the offspring, and he fulfills all the prophecies according to David's family, according to Isaiah chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 7. So Jesus also called himself the bright morning star and prophesied to come the second time in Revelation chapter 2, verse 28. Now, Satan was once called the morning star in Isaiah 14, 12. Hence where we get the name Lucifer, to ensure that there's no confusion that he is not the bright morning star that is Jesus Christ. Rather, like the angels of heaven, which are at times called stars, as we see in Revelation 9-1, or morning stars of Job 38-7, Satan once reflected the glory of God as a morning star, but no longer. It is Jesus who stands above them as the brightest morning star who reflects the glory of God. In Hebrews 1-3, we read, who Jesus being the brightness of of his God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Here in verse 17 of Revelation 22, we read, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Three times the word come occurs in this verse. We go back to Isaiah 55 and John chapter 7. The first two references from the Spirit and the bride are for Jesus to return. And against there's, there's a sense of urgency, longing for his coming. Now Jesus turns the invitation around and he invites the thirsty to come to him and take of the water of life freely, something he alluded to in John chapter 4 and John chapter 7. But believers also need to keep their thirst quenched by coming to him again and again. The water of life costs the one who comes for it nothing, but it costs Jesus greatly. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John six thirty seven, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. In verse 22, 18 and 19, we read, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We always have to be careful with regard to context. Some have wondered if this applies to the whole Bible or is this specific to Revelation. Now, the words of Revelation 22, 18, and 19 are without question a viable principle to apply to the whole Word of God, but that is not what the text is saying specifically. The text says the words of the prophecy of this book, and the book of Revelation was primarily given in a scroll format. In fact, the scroll of Revelation was some 15 feet long, but it was not officially canon to the Bible even until almost 400 AD. Uh, so we believe that there's a direct correlation here to Daniel chapter 12, where we read, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. So the book of Daniel was not a literal book or codex format, especially since we're talking almost 400 years before the first stages of the codex were even developed in Pergamos under King Eumenes and almost a thousand years before the codex book replaced the scrolls. So since the book of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament, containing more than 800 allusions to the Old Testament, with 278 of the 404 verses in Revelation, that's 70% of the book of Revelation being rooted in the Old Testament, the book in question referenced by both Daniel and John, i.e. Revelation, are most likely one and the same. 
So Daniel was not stating that the Bible should be sealed up until the end. So we should not assume that John in Revelation 22, 18 and 19 is referring to the whole Bible either. But the sealed prophecy of Daniel was most likely the revealed prophecy of Revelation. And so we're talking about the prophecy given by God to Jesus who delivered it to John through angels. So with regard to the greater context of the Bible as a whole, we need only to look to the words of the Apostle Paul, where he states in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Or John 1.1 that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, and the warnings of Revelation 22, 18, and 19 aren't required, though they can certainly apply to the whole canonized text, especially with regard to prophecy, since we're told in 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, that in so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture, of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So I believe the warning was needed because of how powerfully transparent the book of Revelation is. The book of Revelation pulled together the prophecies of all the other 17 Old Testament books into a complete and powerful battle plan against Satan, his forces of darkness, and the eradication of sin once and for all. See, even Martin Luther struggled with the book of Revelation. So this stern warning at the end of the book was adding to the signet ring of God himself upon it lest men try to deny its source. So how does one add or take away from the prophecies of Revelation? Well, one way is claiming that there's new revelation, that that the Bible and the book uh, book of Revelation are not enough. And we see that through other books that are added to the text, such as the Book of Mormon and others. We, We know that the Isa of Islam will give new revelations from the Dead Sea, something clearly forbidden according to the words of Jesus here in Revelation. So another way is by claiming advanced knowledge regarding spiritual matters that the Bible does not specifically answer, and that is also wrong according to 2 John 9. So if you cannot support your theology with viable biblical support, then you tread on dangerous ground. Let's read these words. The book of Revelation closes with verses 20 to 21. He who testifies these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I hope this has been an encouraging study for you. There is so much more to this study of the book of Revelation, and we'd love for you to learn more at calvaryfountain.com. Go to calvaryfountain.com. This is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley. Services are at 10 a.m., and we would love to see you there. God bless you, my friend.